I'm delighted to uh, introduce our next speaker, Rima uh, Shaposhnikov. She's in practice in Westlake currently, and she's taken on the challenge of anorectal disorders. I was kindly asked to do this, right? Yes, <laughs> very kindly asked. Right. So benign anorectal disorders obviously is a, is a large topic, and I picked the two topics um, that I think you see a lot in your practice, and I think they may be confusing, and one of them is rectal pain, because that's a really large topic, and patients come in, and there's stuff you can obviously do for them, and of course, the approach uh, to fecal incontinence that you can start before referring to us. But I think the most important thing is, of course, the, that anal canal, and I think if we start reviewing and doing a little bit of anatomy, that may help as well. And the rectal exam, I think it's not limited to gastroenterologists, <laughs> so I'm gonna try at least to convince you to try, to try that in your own practice, right? So this is a basic picture of your anal rectum. The anus itself consists of a mucosa-lined uh, anal canal and the epidermis-lined anal margin. The proximal end, and I do apologize, I don't have a thing, but the proximal end of the anal canal actually begins anatomically at the junction of the puborectalis muscle, and that uh, is a portion of a levator anti muscle. It basically is a distance of four centimeters and extends distally to the anal urge, and that's the anus itself. The anal canal is divided by the dentate line or the pectinate line, as you may have been taught, and that overlies the transitional uh, point from glandular or columnar epithelial to the epidermis itself. The anatomy of the anal canal, uh, we'll, we'll continue with that, is that puborectalis muscle that I mentioned that was part of the levator ani muscle uh, structure, it actually forms a sling. And you want that to be between 80 to 120 centimeters. The failure to maintain that angle in a lot of your patients may explain fecal incontinence that they experience later on. It does, that sling itself relaxes with defecation and usually forms a more vertical orientation. There's also two sphincters that encircle the canal. One of them is internal. That's basically a continuation of the circular or the smooth muscle of the rectum, and it's innervated with your sympathetic and parasympathetic autonomic innervation. The external, the striated muscle, is innervated by your pedental nerve S2 to S4. So that digital rectal exam. So our uh, ACG practice guidelines came out this year in 2014, and it's uh, available to all of you. And they start by saying that it's a gloved finger that's inserted in the anal canal. Uh, I'm going to hope that all of you knew that. It's not the hazmat suit for Ebola, just a gloved finger. So uh, lube was not mentioned, but you know. Um, so we start with the perianal and perineal examinations. And what you want to do is you want to look for obvious pathology. Somebody may have cancer. You may be able to see it without actually, you know, if you are unable to elicit it with the history, you're able to see a lot of things just by doing a rectal exam in your office. And of course, you can elicit the perianal sensation by trying to see if there's any reaction when you touch them on the outside. And you can do it with your finger. You don't have to do a lot of, uh, you know, don't have to have a lot of fancy equipment. The digital rectal exam will also allow you to evaluate the resting tone, the anal sphincter length, and of course symmetry you do want to ask the you want to put the finger in and you do want to ask the patients to bear down that basically impl implies how they're defecating you're asking them not to squeeze just to bear down that will assess the pelvic floor descent and of course if there's any evidence of rectal prolapse you then want to ask the patients to squeeze and you want to assess their squeezing pressure at both rest and while bearing down if you're asking the patients to to strain as if to defecate the normal response is actually a decrease in the anal pressure around your finger you then want to insert the finger actually a little bit deeper because then you're able to palpate, and you don't have to have long fingers. You're able to palpate the puborectalis muscle. You're able to palpate the levator ani. And the patients may have tenderness in that area on further palpation, and, we'll and that's actually pretty significant when we talk about rectal proctalgia and disorders. When the patient strain, again, the normal response is for the muscle to relax, and that will widen that puborectalis angle. The positive predictive value of the rectal exam is actually about 61% in some of the studies. The negative predictive value is around 90%. So it's a pretty, pretty good test uh, to perform. All right, so let's start with a case. As you know, all these cases get to be quite difficult because none of these patients come in and they tell you one thing. There's usually more to the story. So this is a 42-year-old female who had a history of sustained fourth-degree perineal tear during a vaginal birth more than 15 years ago. She had originally had incontinence and had a repair of an external anal sphincter. Her symptoms improved... Uh, immediately after the procedure, but now over the last 13 months or 15 years after surgery, they've actually gotten progressively worse. She noted soiling almost daily, rare accents were associated with looser stools and urgency, but usually she actually had regular bowel movements with semi-formed stools. 
Patient had no rectal pain, no bleeding, no weight loss, no what we call alarm signs or symptoms that would indicate that she had other uh, organic pathology. On the digital rectal exam, there was a reduced anal resting tone. There was no external sphincter contraction or puborectalis contraction uh, to voluntary command. She was referred to an endoanal ultrasound, which showed anterior tear, and that involved greater than 50% of the circumference of the internal and external anal sphincters. So if you guys can join me and answer, I think you have those little uh, pointers, if you can help me out. So what is the most appropriate next step? You can ask, start with A, which is taking a careful dietary history for the consumption of caffeinated products and sugars, fructose, sorbitol. You may even consider an empiric trial of their elimination. B, assessment of the pudental nerve terminal motor latency to evaluate for a pudental neuropathy. C, surgical repair of the anal sphincter defect. She's already had one. Uh, D, colostomy. Uh, and E, implantation of an artificial anal sphincter. All right, so I think most of you realize that colostomy is probably a very drastic procedure, and at 42, a mother of two probably should not lose her colon. Um, implantation of artificial device, although some of you have chosen that, is still really experimental and not really does not have great results. The surgical repair, she's already had one. She's actually not, uh, not a great candidate yet for this. And the simplest thing, and I'll tell you this, when you take any of these GI boards, when they offer you dietary history or any history making, that's usually the right answer on any board question. So um, taking a careful dietary history, at least in this case, is the correct answer. Because a lot of times you want to get more out of the history, maybe just dietary dietary thing. She did great for 15 years after the original uh, sphincter repair. So there's really, there's something else going on there, um, but really no alarm signs or symptoms. So the correct answer is A. So let's talk a little bit about fecal incontinence. It's defined as inadvertent or involuntary uh, passage of stool, soiling, or excessive escape of flatus. The prevalence actually varies in literature from 0.4% to about 25%. According to the United States National Health and uh, Nutrition Survey, about 8.4% of non-institutionalized patients experience fecal soiling. But think of your patients. How many of them do you really ask about that, right? I think we're used to asking about urinary incontinence, but fecal incontinence, a lot of us are really worried. Oh my God, they're going to say yes. What do I do next, right? So you kind of go, okay, great, no diarrhea, constipation, I can fix that, right? So there's also a lot of differing definitions or inadequate data collection. We don't get a lot of right answers, so we don't ask a lot of questions. Patients are reluctant to tell you this, right? They're a little embarrassed. She's 42. She's a successful lawyer. She doesn't want to share that with me. Um, however, females, especially after vaginal delivery, perhaps menopause or change in the pelvic floor, um, are more prone to getting fecal incontinence, advanced age, nurse, uh, nursing home patients, patients with higher BMI. Some of the other strong predictors were noted to be in women are diarrhea and rectal urgency. And the interesting part about it is about two to three decades after having that external anal sphincter defect with the original surgery is when most of them develop incontinence. So it's not always, oh, I just had, I just had the birth of a baby, now I have symptoms. It may be two to three, year, uh, two to three decades after. Multifactorial, right? So the most important thing is, of course, you can have the impaired rectal or colonic storage. It may be somebody who has inflammatory bowel disease affecting that rectosigmoid portion, so therefore the stool is unable to be retained or stored. But it may be the anal sphincter weakness, uh, internal anal sphincter, uh, for example, either trauma, or diabetes, scleroderma. Patients will have loss of stool, but they don't have urge to defecate. So we call it passive incontinence. There's external anal sphincter, and that's urgent continence, where inability to postpone defecation, that may be from the vaginal delivery or just a neurological or even atrophy. Patients may have puborectalis muscle uh, weakness due to dementia, brain stroke, uh, spinal cord injury. There's overflow, and that's important. That's something you guys can fix. If somebody has fecal impaction, you do want to get that history. Pelvic, and that's a fecal seepage usually uh, is how they present uh, due to the impaired sensation. Pelvic floor abnormalities due to rectal prolapse, descending perineum syndrome. And of course, don't forget, they may have b behavioral disorders, IBS, or even diarrhea post-cholecystectomy. So, of course, clinical history is key, right? And a lot of time, uh, we actually even do have a fecal incontinence severity scale. I know none of you are doing that in your office, and I can say honestly that I think most of us don't scale them unless we do uh, research studies, but clinical history is important. Once you've gotten as much history as you can, and no question is a wrong question, find out what happened to them before. How do they present now? What's different? What is bothering them? 
and as much information as you can assess about their daily bowel habits and when the accident occurs, what other medications they're using, that will help you solve a lot of other issues. And of course, I just wanted to put that in because um, one of my friends actually does that cartoon, but the, it's a strong recommendation and moderate quality of evidence that rectal exams are a necessity before you make any further referrals. So this is a complicated diagnostic approach that Dr. Rao actually put together. But, and it's in all your packets, so you don't need to follow this along. But again, the idea is you want to find out if somebody has fecal impaction or diarrhea. And the key to this, there we go. Okay, so because if there's fecal impaction, they're more likely to be constipated, and you want to actually try to deal with the refractory constipation or difficult uh, constipation pathways. However, if there's no fecal impaction, then you want to know, is there diarrhea? So those are probably the two easiest questions you can ask in your practice. Are you usually constipated or are you, you, are you prone to diarrhea? And I think that will help you to differentiate most of the patients. And of course, I'm not mentioning colonoscopy or alarm symptoms, but if that is a good opportunity anytime anyone comes in with any bowel disorders, is to find out if, if they've had their colonoscopy. They're up to date on that. And there's really anything else that uh, is, does not sound like an organic or structural disorder, that, but we're literally dealing with patients that you know are, um, this is their main issue and really nothing else to consider. And keep in mind, if you're able to fix their problems along the way, if you're able to treat them symptomatically, you're good. There's nothing else that you need to do. They will come back and tell you, I feel better or my symptoms have decreased tremendously. I'm okay, I'm able to deal with it. However, if their symptoms have not improved, that's when you follow up with the anal manometry, rectal sensation testing, and further workup that I will talk about next. So these are some of the really beautiful uh, photos to me because I do a lot of high resolution um, motility as does uh, uh, Kevin over here. But anorectal manometry uh, basically allows you to take 250 pressure sensors and then you're able to evaluate the pressure sensation. So not only are we putting something inside somebody's rectum, but based on the pressures, we can actually tell a lot uh, about the internal and external sphincter function, their rectal sensation, as well as compliance, and as well as anal resting and squeezing pressures, which are the key parameters. Diagnostic imaging. When I was in a fellow, which is not that long ago, we used to do these defograms. And if anyone has ever referred a patient to a radiology to sit on a commode, get their barium, and poop in front of the radiologist, you've lost that patient. They never followed up with you again. That is the most awful thing to put, uh, to put a radiologist through. Forget about the patient. I mean, the radiologist has to literally sit there and watch them defecate. Not pleasant, right? So now they finally, the radiologists figured that out, so now there's a dynamic pelvic floor MRI. So it's the same idea of a defogram, except they're in the supine position. They're getting their uh, gadolidium. It's a non, no radiation visualization, but they're able to still assess the sphincter and pelvic floor function, able to assess the perineal descent, and, the mo and this is a great study for uh, diagnosing rectocele seal and anterior seals as well. Um, and the anorectal angles that we talked about, rest, bearing down, and squeezing pressures. These are great things, for, especially if you're considering surgical uh, evaluation. These are, these are very helpful. Endoanal ultrasound is a standard for identifying sphincter injury. It is more accurate for internal than external sphincter, uh, giving you the thickness and integrity of both sphincters, including puborectalis muscle. Keep in mind that anal sphincter defect may be seen after vaginal delivery in up to one-third of the women, and they may be absolute, and one-third of the women who uh, had a vaginal delivery, and may be, they may be completely asymptomatic. So some of the lifestyle modifications, you want to reduce medication with diarrheal adverse side effects. You guys can do this. Look at the medications you've prescribed, and it may be just some of the new medication that are causing the diarrheal side effects. You want to eliminate, I know we've been talking a lot about diet from Nancy uh, um, and on, high in artificial sugars, caffeine, low in fiber, all of those diets itself will reduce the stool consistency, increase episodes of stool loss and leakage, so you want to reduce them. If somebody is in a, in a nursing home, you want to make sure they have scheduled toilet times. You want to make sure they have better access to toilet. And a lot of times we train patients to actually, especially if they're elderly and they need a cane or a walker, to make that time. Schedule them to go to the bathroom. That may prevent some of the soiling and the seepage. If diarrhea is the cause, of course, uh, bulking fiber agents are recommended. And if overflow incontinence is a cause, again, a strict bowel regimen and a trial of fiber, psyllium is considered more superior since um, uh, it is resistance to fermentation in the small bowel. The definitive evidence that all of you are looking for is actually missing, again, not a lot of data because the trials really have to be large and randomized controlled in order to show true improvement, but um, 
a lot, of, a lot enough data to suggest that these are great recommendations. The opinions do differ about which kind of fiber, and we do know that tricyclics, although not gluten, they do increase the FI or um, fecal incontinence uh, score. So that may be well as well. So biofeedback, I think you've heard that word today a couple of times. It's a non-operative technique used when conservative or dietary uh, management are insufficient. It improves muscular strength and control of the pelvic floor. It enhances uh, sensory perception of rest, uh, rectal distension and coordinating both aspects to improve continence. We do have retrospective small studies. So the problem is some of them, of course, overestimate success, and some of the studies list 90% as a success. So it's probably someplace in the middle, between 60 to 75% of patients who do great. The 2012 systemic review from Cochrane actually said that randomized controlled studies concluded addition of biofeedback to any uh, conservative therapy was superior than just conservative therapy alone. So now you've tried everything, and now you want to basically say they need to go to a GI doctor, and the GI doctor can offer them something new. So let's talk about what something new is available. We try to inject something into the internal anal sphincter to make it strong. And this is not new on the concept. This is a new product. But we've tried fat and Teflon, which, by the way, as soon as I read that, I didn't really want to cook anymore. Um, <laughs> bovine collagen, silicone, a lot of things have been tried. This is the, one of the newest things. It's called NASH, or non-animal stabilized hyaluronic acid. And it's a dextranomer made by Salix. Basically, what the idea is it augments the anal sphincter area. We inject it into four little areas in, into the submucosa in the four quadrants proximal to the dentate line. And it does improve continence in patients with low anal and sphincter pressures. Most of the studies, basically, again, it's an alternative before aggressive surgery. Uh, it does decrease an up about 75% of the number of incontinent episodes. Uh, some of the side effects that we worry about is erectile abscess and prostatic abscess, and those are less than uh, uh, 5%, so pretty low, you know, low numbers. Additional things that could be tried are sacral nerve stimulation. Again, we reserve these for severe cases. They do improve squeeze pressure of the anal sphincter and rectal sensation. They do show promising results. It's basically a low amplitude electrical current that you apply to the sacral nerve, or S3, uh, via electrode in the sacral foramen. And what they do have is a uh, temporary external neurostimulator, so you know which patients respond well before implanting the, uh, the more permanent uh, idea. Surgery. Um, is not the last thing, but it, you know we try to re reserve it for the really severe cases. The idea of surgery, it's a re you want to repair that sphincter or create a new or neosphincter. Uh, best works for women who have evidence of significant sphincter tear, uh, often again due to obstetric uh, trauma. So in conclusion, my patient did well by just looking at her diet. She was able to decrease her episodes. She didn't realize how much she's, you know, she's 42, running as a lawyer. She really is able to now look at her diet and decrease her episodes. We did do an anal ultrasound. As you know, there was a tear. So we know that there's something in the future to consider, perhaps a, a repair. But that's a big surgery. So we're, again, waiting to see if her symptoms worsen over the last uh, next uh, few years. So again, fecal incontinence is a multifactorial disorder. You do need good history, and if once you start with that, a lot of issues um, can be eliminated. So second case, I had a 45-year-old female who presents with rectal pain occurring uh, following rectal movement, lasts up to 45 minutes each time. There was no underlying medical issues. Patients had two prior C-sections, no vaginal deliveries. On the rectal exam, she was tender to palpation when pressed on the levator ana muscle, so deeper end. She tried every ointment, cream, sits bath, stool softener, everything you've suggested, she's already tried it. So now she comes in to find out about additional therapy. So if you guys can press those buttons. But, uh, a for botulin A, uh, 100 units injected into the levator ana muscle. Diazepam, orally, biofeedback uh, to relax those pelvic floor muscles, and electrical stimulation. All right, so you guys do know how to take your test. Yeah, anytime you see biofeedback, <laughs> perfect. So the second topic is rectal pain. I find that the most confusing because patients come in and they go, but I have rectal pain. And then they go, but that's it. That's all I want to tell you. I have nothing else. I just have rectal pain. But you want to get a little bit of more history. When does it occur and how long does it last? Other names for proctologist syndromes are levator anine syndrome, so you know the location of it, levator spasms, puborectalis syndrome, and even pelvic tension myalgia used to be the CPT codes prior. But basically, it's a recurring episodes of rectal pain or aching that occur 20 minutes or greater. So that's the dividing point, 20 minutes or greater. So obviously our patient falls into this category. Mm -hmm. On digital rectal exam, there's pain with pressure to levate our ANA muscles. They're definitely tender. There was one study to show they were more tender on the left versus right. I don't know if any of you really need to pay attention to it. If somebody says, ouch, 
that's probably good enough. You want to exclude chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain, and of course, inflammatory bowel disease and other organic um, GI uh, uh, conditions. But the pathophysiology basically is, def is due to sustained contraction or spasm of the pelvic floor muscles, and therefore the therapy is directed at relaxing those striated muscles of the pelvic floor. This is not to be confused with proctalgia fugae, which lasts seconds to less than 20 minutes. It's more of an intense and sharper pain than the prior pain that I've mentioned. We think it's due to thickening of the internal anal sphincter. There's really no identifiable triggers, at least in the literature. And again, we want to rule out structural uh, causes using imaging or colonoscopy. But according to ACG guidelines of this year, you just want to reassure the patients that the disorder is benign. It, yes, they have pain, but yes, you know, and you need to figure out what triggers are affecting that individual patient. But the evidence for specific treatments, warm baths, warm water enemas, topical glycerin, clonidine, lo local anesthetics, Botox, all of those are really not better than anecdotal. So back to the diagnostic assessments. You know, again, a kind of complicated slide, but you once you've ruled out with physical exam that there's no structural diagnosis, you want to find out if there's IBS. You want to find out, is there association between bowel movements and eating? Is the pain better after defecation? Then they go back into the IBS category. That's a little bit different. But if the answer is no, how long is the pain? Is it proctalgia fuga? Is it less than 20 minutes or is it longer? Is it longer? Is it then tender to palpation? Because those patients are the ones that do great with biofeedback therapy. Okay. So this is one of the studies from uh, Gastro uh, 2010 for, by Chiaroni. And basically, he was able to take, there's only two randomized controlled studies, so this is the largest one. He was able to take 157 patients and randomize them to nine therapies of the three treatments below, electrical stimulation, digital massage, and uh, pelvic uh, floor biofeedback. He was able to do that for uh, tw uh, basically 12 months. They followed the patients for 12 months. And then they stratified those patients where they tender to palpation with that rectal exam and levator anal muscles or not. If tenderness was present with biofeedback in intent to treat category, 87% of patients had relief. With electrical stimulation, 45%. With digital massage, which I just want to point out, that dates back to 1936. I don't know how many patients agreed to it on a regular basis, but 22% uh, reduction in tenderness. The pain decreased from 14.7 days to down to 3.3 days. So there's definitely data to show you that this compared to you know 157 patients, there was obviously comparison um, to, sh to patients who got, um, you know they, they didn't know what they were getting a probe with nothing else going on, um, they did significantly better. The other randomized controlled study actually used 100 units of botulin toxin versus placebo and only had 12 patients. And again, the data actually showed that that was not significant in any of the patients. Five dropped out of the study. So um, botulin toxin may not be the best for proctalgia pain. May work for proctalgia fugue for that sharp pain, but not for long-term proctalgia. So back to biofeedback. We keep coming back to that. It does teach relaxation of the pelvic floor muscles during stimulated defecation. But you only get positive response if patients actually have either abnormal anorectal monometry, have that tenderness to palpation of elevator anti muscles, they have failure to relax the pelvic floor muscles when stimulating defecation. So not everyone is going to respond, but if they do, we do have therapy for them. And uh, a little plug for UCLA, we do offer um, biofeedback therapy that works uh, great for most of the patients. Additional causes of rectal pain, just because they're coming in, again, we're GI doctors, we think you know, certain GI pain, but it's up to you guys to make sure there's no chronic pain, no prostatitis, no other symptoms that we're missing. But one of the things that I see a lot in clinic is an anal fissure, so I thought I'd st spend a few minutes talking about something you guys can see. So anal fissure is basically a longitudinal tear in the midline of the anal canal. It is distal to the dentate line. And most patients will give you a very specific history without even eliciting. They will say it's like pooping glass. Once you hear that, chances are you do need to do that rectal exam because you want to find out if that's the case. It's painful defecation. There's pain post-defecation. If rectal bleeding occurs, it's usually minimal and frequent, uh, only because it's right there uh, at the anus. Posterior midline is most of the location, about 90% of the time. Anterior may occur, obviously, the rest of the time. If somebody has a lateral thing, and this is actually a board question, but you should know that anyways, lateral uh, uh, fissure, think of Crohn's, think of TB, think of syphilis, Anal carcinoma, that's not a typical location, something else is going on. So just a cute little picture of an anal fissure. 
but location, 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 right? You got to know it. All right. So acute and chronic is how we think of fissures because more than 90% of acute fissures are short-lived and they will heal with simple measures. Those are the patients that go, oh, by the way, it kind of hurt to go to the bathroom. I had a really large stool, but I'm okay now. Do you want to look? And you can say yes, because that's what you're supposed to say. But if it went away, that's pretty good. Now, chronic fissures, the one that occurs greater than eight weeks of, uh, of pain, they will have edema, they will have fibrosis. They actually develop something called anal skin tag, or what we call a sentinel pile at the, uh, at the distal fissure margin. And usually that's due to the spasm of the sphincter and ischemia. Less than 10% of chronic ones are the ones that are going to be self-limited. So the pathogenesis is pretty clear. There's an initial trauma, but then there's ischemia. The posterior midline actually gets less blood than the other quadrants by about half. And there's even less blood supply at the fissure site. So that leads to decreased ability to heal. There's also increased anal pressure due to the internal sphincter tone. Um, and that leads to the spasm, spasm of the muscle and therefore the pain that they have associated with the anal fissures. So some of the goals, of course, is to relax that anal sphincter. You want to stop the cycle of sphincter spasm and tearing. You want to use supportive measures, whether it's cis bath, fiber, uh, or topical anesthetics. You want to use topical calcium channel blockers. And the idea is that the smooth muscle contraction is actually mediated by increased isosolic calcium levels. So by blocking calcium, you actually are able to um, reduce the internal anal sphincter function. You want to use topic, either topical calcium channel or nitroglycerin uh, glycerin channel, uh, nitroglycerin, excuse me. Either The reason I put unclear efficacy is just unclear which one of them is better. So there are mixed results. Patients will probably complain of headaches and dizziness. Most of those compounds are usually at the compound pharmacy, so you can't really get it at regular pharmacy. So maybe have one compound pharmacy they refer to. The reason I put 0.5 to 2%, I had one pharmacy that only did 1%. I have another one that only does 2%. Not enough data to say which one works better. Injection of botulin toxin into internal sphincter has a healing rate of up to 90%. So really pretty good results. Um, we do inject about 30 units of botulin toxin. And of course, uh, that, that may work for your patients. We do know that's slightly more effective than just regular topical nitroglycerin therapy. Surgery is not the last resort, but it can be used successfully. And so if your patients are really not doing well, and again, this is a long-term condition, so don't expect them to see once and say, okay, you're going to be fine with this compound solution. You may need to see them for four, eight, maybe even 12 weeks of repeated therapy until you say, okay, something, you know, either they have not used stool softeners, they're still having hard stool, the trauma and the ischemia are continuing, so you may need to work on other dietary and lifestyle modifications. But eventually, if you do refer them to surgery, the most common procedure is called the lateral internal sphincterotomy, and that di divides the internal sphincter from interspheneranic grove to the top of the fissure. The low rate of disease recurring is supposed to be less than 10%. There's medical management. Uh, the, we consider medical management to be less effective than surgery. But keep in mind, the fecal incontinence complication rate can be up to 30%. But you already know how to treat fecal incontinence. We did that first. So you should be all set if that does occur, right? 90% um, of uh, patients actually heal after surgery, and the most important determinant to surgery is actually the extent or the length of the sphincterotomy that doctors need uh, to perform. So I couldn't find a good rectal uh, thing, but this is a doctor looking in your ear and says it could be anything. So to go from way too general a practitioner to being a great doctor, which I'm sure all of you are, really is just history and physical exam for both incontinence and rectal pain. And you can help your patient before just referring them out to us. They will feel like you've solved their problem and you're the greatest. And really a lot of it is dietary uh, things. And I have to put a plug in for that rectal exam. So um, that's it. Thank you.